makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Global stocks drop after the latest data from China shows more weakness in the world's second biggest economy, Fed Minutes, later today. Now, the Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis pledges to repay two years of bailout loans ahead of schedule. We'll bring you more from our exclusive interview. We will be able, uh, before the end of the year, to actually repay ahead of time uh, our GLFA facility. Plus, oil traders await comments from the Saudi energy minister at today's OPEC international seminar after the country and Russia pledged output cards were live in Vienna with Manus Cranny. Now, first thing is first, let's check on the markets. A lot of focus, of course, on data. Out of China, European stock, you can see a bit under pressure. They really followed some of the Asian shares lower. The latest data from China showing more weakness in the world's second biggest economy. What that means for the rest of the world is that we could see a little bit uh, less support when it comes to, for example, some of the commodity usage break. This is, you know, one of the things that we're looking for. It's if anything in China's economy is actually breaking the sputtering services industry, raising concern really about the outlook for the global economic growth at a time when most major central banks are still in tightening zone. Now, Euro area June services, PMI is also coming in there. Of course, the final reading coming in at 52 instead of the preliminary reading of 52.4. That's pretty much in line with expectations. Again, anything above 50 means that we're in expansionary territory. So Asian equities falling, U.S. futures lower after subdued trading. This is also after the U.S. holiday yesterday. Happy 4th of July for all of our American viewers. Attention now turning to the Fed minutes today. Now, traders seeking insights into why the central bank decided to take a pause in its hiking cycle and what the potential is for more rate hikes. So well, let's get straight to Christine Aquino and Eddie van der Valt. We have a, a double duo looking at the market. So thank you both for joining us. Christine, first of all, how do we put into context what's happening in China? How much of a worry is this for the world economy? Well, quite worrying, Francine. I mean, I think this just furthers the narrative that China really isn't the overwhelming positive story that all of us, I think, were hoping it would be at the beginning of this year. I mean, remember, it was meant to be kind of the growth engine of the world economy in 2023 as it exited COVID zero lockdowns, and especially contrasting with what's happening in, in the U.S., right? Tightening policy and fears over that leading to a recession. China was meant to be the counterpoint to that. It's just not playing out. Yeah, and Eddie, I was in Sintra last week, of course, that's where Jay Powell was, and he was at Pains and trying to explain exactly what he's seeing in the economy, which is they're data dependent, but actually they'll stop at nothing also to do 2%. The markets haven't really quite latched on to the real messaging of that. Yeah, and it's a really difficult message for them to get across, right? On the one hand, we're pausing. On the other hand, we're probably going to hike later again. And, and you, you know, the market just kind of it doesn't know whether to believe this or not. Now, we're getting the Fed minutes. I don't know whether the Fed minutes are going give, to give us any more clarity because, as you say, Powell's already spoken at Sintra and you know has already given us a, a, a more than was uh, that was probably in the meeting what we're really gonna have to wait for I guess is for the jobs data at the end of the week because that's what the, the, the Fed is looking towards too because they want to see whether the economy remains strong mm -hmm. and whether you know whether that allows them to turn this pause into another series of hikes yeah and I want to talk about of course some of the credit out there in just a second we're back with Christine and Eddie shortly but we also had an interview with the Greek Prime Minister that was yesterday in Athens in his office now the Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis has pledged to repay two years of bailout loans ahead of schedule. The yield on Greece's two-year bond fell after his comments in this exclusive interview with me in Athens. I'd say the first uh, goal, uh, and I think it's a very tangible goal, is to get to investment grade before the end of the year. Uh, I'm very confident that we will actually <laughs> succeed in, uh, in doing that. And then in terms of the actual structural reforms, I want to continue making Greece a very attractive destination for foreign investment. We've been very successful in attracting foreign investment over the past four years, but we need to keep up um, this, uh, this pace. And this, of course, means uh, various interventions when it comes to the business environment. I'm very preoccupied with justice. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, we accelerate um, uh, justice reform and that the courts don't take for ages in order to reach a, a final decision. And I'm also particularly concerned about offering Greeks quality health care, mm -hmm. 
we have a, um, a public health system, a national health system. Uh, it survived the pandemic, but it's about time to make some significant changes to make it more uh, efficient. Prime Minister, you're very confident that you'll get investment grade. When you get investment grade, what does that mean? What does that change in terms of possible extra investment coming to the country? I think it changes um, lots of things. Uh, there's currently a lot of capital that cannot invest in Greece simply because we're not investment grade. As you know, we are already trading as if uh, yeah. we are an investment grade uh, country, but we also need uh, the official stamp of approval by the rating uh, agencies. Uh, it, I think it will further lower uh, our cost of borrowing, which of course is important uh, in a high interest environment. We've been able to defy the trend. Uh, the Greek economy is going to grow significantly uh, in, uh, in 2023. And this is also giving us a fiscal space to, um, to further reduce our debt. Uh, we will be able, uh, before the end of the year, to actually repay ahead of time uh, our GLFA facility for the next two years. And I think this will also send a positive signal to the markets that not only are we focused on growth, but we also want to make sure that our debt to GDP ratio continues to decline at a very rapid pace. I mean, is this a promise to, yes. it's a promise to what, we will investors? Repay, yeah, we will, and it's, and it's a commitment to investors. We will uh, accelerate the reforms uh, and we will make sure that uh, whatever reforms we implement will be done in such a way not to compromise our country's uh, fiscal position. Greece went through a lot, through a very painful uh, period. We will never ever relive these difficult times. But I think we've proven that you can drive high growth, you can reasonably reduce taxes while at the same time maintaining very healthy uh, public finances. Uh, and I do expect uh, uh, our debt to GDP to continue to decline significantly. And of course, again, this will also give us the, f the fiscal space to make sure that we ensure uh, uh, markets that we're serious and actually repay part of our debt ahead of time. Well, that was the Greek Prime Minister talking exclusively to me on his message to the markets. Uh, joining us for more on what Mitsotakis had to say, Paul Tagbo, who's, of course, in the room with us. He's Athens Deputy Bureau Chief, Eddie and Christine are also still with us. So, Paul, uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis is very ambitious in what he wants to achieve. Will he manage to deliver for investors? Good morning, Francine. Indeed, very ambitious. But as the old saying goes, where there's a will, there's a way. And he certainly has the will to bring um, forward what he sees as key structural reforms. We should point out that these reforms are what markets are expecting, and especially the rating agency, in terms of what Greece needs to do to regain investment grade, which is the holy grail for Greece. In terms of those reforms, the three areas that he wants to focus on in particular are reform of the judicial system, the health system, and the education system. Probably the most difficult of those is the judicial system. As we know, Greek courts are notoriously slow at reaching decisions. And as part of his efforts to make Greece even more business friendly, investor friendly, as he wants to carry on boosting FDI that's coming into the country, <clears throat> it's important for companies to know that if there's recourse for whatever reason to the courts, they don't take ages to reach a decision. He's a very hands-on prime minister. Um, he lets his ministers get on with the job, but he's in constant touch with them. He regularly visits ministry to see the progress of work. Um, and as we should point out, this is his second term, and he already has a track record of being successful in reforms. In, in his first term in office, he managed to bring through legislation to help Greek banks reduce yeah. non-performing loans and also reform the labor sector. So he has a track record. He knows what he wants to do, and he has the will to do it. Yeah, uh, Paul, and we also spoke, of course, about the IPO for Athens Airport. He sees that early next year. We had a conversation about, for example, how he wants to recalibrate ties with Turkey. But with little to no opposition in Parliament, can he actually get all the reforms through, you know, quicker than any other prime minister in Europe? In theory, yes. I mean, his majority is such in Parliament that he will have no opposition to anything that he wants to bring through the chamber in terms of legislation. Just to give people an idea of, of that, he has 158 seats in the 300-seat parliament. And the next biggest party, the Syriza party, only has 47 seats. And, and in terms of censures being brought against the government in terms of what it wants to do, under parliamentary law here in Greece, you need 50 MPs to do that. And as I said, the second party only has 47. So he really has a clean slate to bring through whatever legislation he wants in parliament. There may be more voices against what he wants to do, as a new parliament in Greece has eight parties compared to five in, in, in the, when he was last in government. 
but, but in spite of that extra noise in Parliament that's anticipated, he's in a very strong position to bring through whatever leg legislation he wants. Mm -hmm. Paul, thank you so much. Paul Togwell, our Deputy Bureau Chief in Athens, joining us today. Now, Christina and Eddie are still with us. Eddie, when you look at, you know, what Mitsotakis has said, stepping up the reforms to try and, and you know, confine, I guess, a Greek crisis to the history books, I mean, how in, in this context is Europe doing as a whole? We know, yeah. we've talked about this before, that U.S. investors still see it as a problem in child worldwide. Yeah. Uh, Francine, first of all, I must congratulate you because you extracted some really robust language from him in that interview where, you know, he's made a, a, a real strong commitment to this but it but to your point it it's exactly right this shows just how far Europe has come right um, the, the last time around in the last crisis Europe was the problem child and uh, we saw that in the banking crisis this time around as well that it was much more centered on the US and Europe just looks a lot more stable um, and, and and you know a lot more a lot less panicky uh, and and is able to meet these challenges uh, com coming out looking quite robust yeah I, I wonder whether we've seen those like valuation one is there still quite a lot to go for for European stocks absolutely Francine yeah and I think you know at this point in time it, it, the value proposition has something is something that has always been kind of uh, the main appeal of European stocks right but it hasn't really like come to fruition in terms of really kind of shifting their appeal and shifting some of those investors in the US away from 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 that area and back into Europe and so you know in the second half I think that's really going to be um, I mean, it's, it's going to be one of the, the the areas of focus but also simultaneously especially when we get another round of earnings uh, pretty soon here um, I think the, the the question for the second half for a lot of companies here is is more than valuations kind of um, what their outlook is going to be um, how they're going to be preparing for the tougher times ahead potentially and also their margins and how uh, they're going to be able to keep up those profit margins and whether they're going to be able to keep passing on those higher costs to consumers it's because there is lower tolerance for that now yeah it's incredible I saw an analyst note yesterday saying look it's really tech that's driving us here mm. in Europe we have fashion I don't know what, <laughs> what that means for prospects going forward coming up more from our exclusive interview with the Greek Prime Minister thank you both uh, both Eddie and of course Christine will stay with us we'll get their views on China don't miss that that's next and this is Bloomberg <laughs> The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is a pulse on Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the Chinese President Xi Jinping has called on nations to spurn decoupling and the disconnect of supply chains. Now, Xi made the appeal a day after his nation posed limits on exports of two key metals used to make chips. China stands ready to work with all sides to keep to the right direction of economic globalization, oppose protectionism, unilateral sanctions, and the overstretching of national security, and reject the moves of setting up barriers, decoupling, and severing supply chains. And back to our exclusive interview with the Greek Prime Minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis. This is what he told us about his hopes for relations with China. Uh, we can work with China on various issues, but they're also a competitor, they're also a rival. Uh, on, ma on, on many other issues, but uh, I've been advocating for, you know, for a comprehensive European approach vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China, so we don't want to decouple, and we, frankly, we cannot decouple, but we want to de-risk. Well, Christina Kino and Eddie van der Waal are still with me. Christina, I'm not sure what to do with China at the moment, because China data is not looking good. We're not really getting enough support from PBOC or some of the policymakers. And then there's all these extra measures they're putting on, on you know, preventing them to, to actually um, sell some of their very important stuff. Yeah, absolutely, Francine. I mean, I think this just adds another layer of uncertainty with regards to how investors treat China. As you mentioned, you know, I think at, at this point in time, uh, that extra layer of geopolitical tension, of course, that this creates, um, probably not helpful when it comes to sentiment, right? And so I think it, you know, some of the things that, that I kind of, um, in my initial reaction to the news actually was kind of ringing uh, some inflation alarm bells as well, because, um, you know, it's continuously trading bars between the U.S. and China, not particularly helpful. And of course, 
course, the question is going to be, what is this going to do in terms of the prices of the goods that are kind of caught in the crossfires of this? Yeah, so what are we doing, Eddie, for when you look at China and some of the things that they've put in place? I mean, what does this tell us about how belligerent they want to be with the West? Yeah, look, it's, 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 it's I think... The, these are obviously significant moves, but it is not Trump era uh, escalations that we're seeing, right? Um, we're talking about gallium and geranium, two particular metals that are used in chips and in other, you know, important sectors like solar panels and so on. But but it's 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 clearly not an escalation of the scale that we had uh, back then. So I think China is trying to strike a very very um, intricate balance here, in that they they want to to look tough without acting too tough. Um, and I think as long as that's the case, that's okay. But I think we've got to remember that we're coming up to a U.S. election and both parties want to take on China. And I think, you know, so I think over the next year, this theme could just, you know, expand uh, significantly. But are we decoupling? Is there any chance that we're not decoupling, given also that Germany gave 10 billion to Intel to try and also do a factory yeah. to actually stop its dependence on manufacturing of chips? Yeah, I, look, I, I, whether we'll see a complete decoupling of, of, of global supply chains, I think that's uncertain. But I think companies will want to have contingencies in place because they don't want to have the exposure, not just because of the trade wars, right, but also because of uh, what we saw during the COVID crisis. Where right. Companies saw that they are not robust, they are not secure if they don't have control over much of their own production. So I think they want to have contingencies in place. And um, countries are, are looking at this more and more. So, yes, I think this will be a slow drumbeat uh, to that sort of deglobalization that we've seen so far um, in the in the post-pandemic period. Yeah, and how much will that take hold for actually supply chains as well? Well, frankly, I mean, it could be quite a significant shift. Again, this idea of decoupling and French shoring, I, I think this kind of um, uh, uh, creates the potential for um, the process of supply chains to fundamentally change from here. I think, you know, we can treat this as kind of the post-COVID era of supply chains. As Eddie mentioned, I think, you know, the, the, the pandemic really um, showed the vulnerabilities of, of global supply chains. And then, of course, we saw as well the impact of that when it came to higher prices. I mean, that's one of the contributors to um, the inflation issue that we're facing now. And so I think uh, the, the idea of kind of countries trying to create contingencies, even if they don't completely decouple, uh, this has the potential to usher in a new era of how countries and companies really think about supply chains, really think about how they make those more robust um, and potentially avoid some of the issues that we're facing now. All right. Thank you both, uh, Christine and Eddie there, Christina Kino and Eddie van der Rolt from our M Live team. Check it out. It's a great, great blog on the terminal. Now you can watch, of course, our full interview with the Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis on Leaders with L'Aqua, and that's on the 19th of July. Coming up, we go live to Vienna, where OPEC's conference is taking place, bringing together some of the world's biggest oil producers. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. We're going live to Vienna now, where OPEC's international seminar kicking off. The conference starts at an important point after Saudi Arabia announced earlier this week it would extend a voluntary production cut, with Russia also saying it would reduce crude exports. Well, joining us now from Vienna is the one and only Manus Cranny. Manus, as OPEC meets, how bad is the demand Pretty. for Outlook globally? Pretty darn bad. Just look around you. Uh, it's the graveyard of a global manufacturing recession. Yes, we might be flying like Billio, uh, and I have in the past three, four weeks. I've consumed more jet fuel than your average traveler. But that's not going to save the oil price. Let me give you a clue. Jet fuel is about 5% of global demand. You've got China, the Chaixin, this morning under pressure. You've got European recession. Uh, the 12th straight month, we're sub-50 on the PMIs. America, the worst since longest run of uh, drops since 2008. And the whole of Asia is under pressure. Now, there's an old saying. A friend of mine went to see U2 play uh, a few weeks ago, actually a few months ago, and he said, Manus, you can't put lipstick on a pig. And that's what we're looking at. We have a global manufacturing recession here. You can only control a certain number of variables. You can control what goes into the pot, i.e. the overall supply from OPEC+. Plus. But what's happening is this unilateral cut from Saudi Arabia, that's been extended. The Russians got on board with another 500. Now, here's the nuance. They've said they'll cut exports by 500,000 and they, they may cut production by 500,000. But there's only one piece of that jigsaw that you can trust. It is the export data because that is the data that will be yep. 
verified, so to speak. Right now, they are desperately trying to put a floor under this price. Hence, the preemptive action by His Royal Highness Prince Abdullah is bin Salman, who walked through those doors and he apparently said, I had a good time in New York last week, but nothing about the market. All right, what's the impact to that, of the Saudis on extending their unilateral cuts? Uh, and, the, you know, their unilateral cuts and Russia making this additional cut? I think this is about the royal alignment. Think about it. Riyadh and Moscow. This is a symbiotic relationship that needs to be proven to the world, is robust, it is strong. One has an economic dream, as I have said three, four weeks ago when I was here, uh, to keep alive, which is the Saudi dream of Neo, Malula, etc. And that's going to cost 80 bucks or 100 bucks, according to the Bloomberg data, on a fiscal break even. If you want to make all the dreams come true, then you've got to keep that alive. And Putin needs oil for war. Thank you so much, Manus Cranny. There with the very latest on OPEC. We'll have plenty more from Manus throughout the day. Now, coming up, Blackstone, global co-head of real estate, Kathleen McCarthy, joins us. Don't miss that conversation. That's next. And this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Global stocks drop after the latest data from China show more weakness in the world's second biggest economy, while well, Fed minutes out later today. The Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis pledges to repay two years of bailout loans ahead of schedule. We will be able, uh, before the end of the year, to actually repay ahead of time uh, our GLFA facility. Plus, oil traders await comments from the Saudi energy minister at today's OPEC international seminar after the country, along with Russia, pledged to output cuts. We're live in Vienna. Now, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francie Lacqua here in London. Now, rising interest rates and falling property values are heaping pressure on the commercial real estate sector. The hit from higher rates is being felt mostly in Europe. Now, in the U.S., more than a fifth of office space lies empty in several major cities. Let's discuss all of this with Kathleen McCarthy, Blackstone's global co-head of real estate. So, Kathleen, thank you so much for coming on. There's so much to talk about when it comes to commercial real estate and real estate in general. Where, at, at the moment, are, are you seeing value? Well, thanks, Francine, for having me. It's great to be on with you. I would say in real estate, what you own matters today. And our portfolio is over 80% concentrated in the top performing sectors. And that's because starting over a decade ago, we said we want to position our investors' capital in the asset classes where we see long-term macro demand trends mm -hmm. outpacing new supply. And we want there to be cash flow and cash flow growth so that if we found ourselves in an environment like we're in today, where rates are higher for longer, we could combat the pressure on valuations with cash flow. And so 40% of what we own is in logistics assets, yeah. much, a huge portion of our portfolio is in rental housing, and then hospitality, data centers, and lab office as well. And these sectors are performing extraordinarily well. Yeah, so you're extremely di diversified, but how much stress are you seeing in certain parts? Or how much redemptions, for example, are you still seeing in B-REITs? Well, what I would say is that performance matters, in B-REIT included. B-REIT has generated a 12% net return since inception. That's three times what the public yes. markets have given investors. And so while certainly there's some repositioning of investor portfolio, we see both with institutional clients and, of course, with individuals and investors as well, performance is what leads to the opportunity to attract more capital. And so I think in an environment like today, these investors are gravitating towards us, and you saw this with our $30 billion record-setting global capital raise, because they see us as having generated strong performance in lots of different kinds of environments and able to capitalize on the dislocation yeah. today. But are, are you having to sell anything off to actually raise liquidity? So is it, you know, you have these performing units or performing real estate and one does well, so you sell it off to make sure that you have enough for the rest? Well, we are able to be very selective sellers. We have designed all of our different pools of capital to make sure we are not under pressure to sell. Right. We want to be able to protect value and to really grow valuations, you know, even in a dislocated environment. So where you see us selling, it's where we're seeing well-capitalized buyers able, able to pay you know, attractive values from our perspective and where we can capture those wins for our clients. So just last week, we announced a $3 billion transaction with Prologis, where we're selling assets in logistics space out of our opportunistic fund. These are assets where we have grown cash flows and you know, really we've done the work we need to do for our opportunistic investors. Similarly in BREIT, again, showing the real contrast in markets, right. there was a week full of news about the, the challenges in, in San Francisco office.
office, it's San Francisco Hospitality Assets, and yet in San Antonio, Texas, we were able to sell an asset for $800 million, generating $275 million of gain for our clients. And so the power of being a selective seller is that, again, you can generate great performance. It's really on the other side of that where we see other owners who maybe do have liquidity pressures whether it's public companies that need to generate liquidity to delever yeah. or managers who have not designed their funds to withstand some of those those redemption pressures, we're able to transact and purchase assets, yeah. act quickly, speed and yeah. certainty, that translates into value. And we see that as an opportunity in this environment. So Kathleen, where are you seeing the most stress? I know, for example, warehouses are extremely sensitive to higher interest rates. What, what happens to those kind of units? Well, I'd say really the greatest stress is probably in the older US traditional office space. Yeah. But again, you know, I'd say you have to you can't even just look at office as one yeah. one big thing particularly the quality of the office and 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 the location of it matters tremendously and so you know actually i would say logistics is at kind of the other end of the spectrum generating very strong performance here in the uk where we have last mile logistics assets we're seeing new leases signed at rates 50 percent higher than older leases and and that is you know kind of consistent with what we're yeah. seeing for logistics particularly in the more urban locations around the world. So how are you expecting the, the market to try and adapt to some of these situations? Are you already seeing or, or will see, for example, some of the banks sell off their you know, non-performing real estate loans? You know, what, what we know is that in a market that becomes more capital constrained, so what, the availability of debt is more scarce and that, that rates are higher, is that you know, it really, again, favors well-capitalized buyers. And so I think what we're seeing right now, and you can look at this in our transaction activity, 90% of what we've done year to date is really in our, our top couple of themes, in particular uh, housing, including student housing here in the UK, logistics, lab office. And that's partly because sellers are disposing of some of their best quality assets that you know, have, have appetite from investors like us so that they can deal with pressures elsewhere in the portfolio. And so I think you know, oftentimes, again, we see you know, those kinds of assets come out kind of early in these moments in the cycle, and we, we create those kinds of opportunities for our clients. So especially in the UK, or are there other pockets of opportunities like that in Europe? Well, we have been one of the UK's most active investors for probably 20 years or more now. And we are seeing great opportunities in the UK. I think sometimes what we find is that when sentiment gets really negative, prices decouple from fundamental yeah. value. Yeah. And again, for us, we just have a practice of trying to quiet that noise, yeah. look at the information in front of us. Again, I can point to that really strong performance in our UK logistics portfolio. We're seeing similar things yeah. in UK student housing where, you know, UK education is one of the most sought after things in the world, and yet there aren't enough beds by a long shot to supply housing for all of those students. And so we keep going in those themes. And again, a little bit of you know, negativity, negative sentiment can sometimes create the best opportunities for us. How do you call it bottom, though? So I don't think we you know, ever try to say we've kind of hit bottom. You don't get an all clear signal from the market. And so you know, what we do is we just you know, stay present. We stay attentive to the insights and information we have. We have more data than any other investor on the planet. We have $600 billion of real estate, 12,000 assets. That's feeding us information and insights to drive where we transact. And that's why, particularly in a market like now, where you see a lot of uncertainty, we're going to be very selective, but not be afraid either to kind of lead into where we see strength short term and over the long term. Um, Kathleen, I, I keep on hearing that actually European commercial real estate is frozen because there's a mismatch between what buyers are ready to pay and what you know a lot of the sellers are asking for the price. When does that come to a head? Does it you know start normalizing soon, or are you going to have these frozen assets? Well, I would say you know, really probably starting a year ago, all over the world you saw transaction activity become a bit more muted, and that's again because like you're saying, the sellers and buyers Expect, you know, don't yeah. have, may have different expectations <laughs> on the price. But we've actually been able to continue investing. In Europe alone, we've invested 3.5 billion euros this year, again, all really thematically based around what we like. And so you know, what, I, what I expect to happen is, and, and this is typical in our experience of doing this, is that you know, it takes a period of time for sellers to kind of recognize that it was maybe time to move on or maybe time to settle into some new pricing. And then you start to see the valuations pick up, mo pick up again. And oftentimes some of the earlier transactions are in and around yeah. public companies. We have more experience than anyone transacting with public companies. We've done 50 take privates in our history. But it's not just the take private activity. It's the ability to, to purchase assets 
assets and do that quickly and with certainty that public companies need. And I think you seem to be suggesting you also almost want to be a stabilizing role, right, for, for this asset, which, which frankly is seen as the next hot thing that, that could really create something ugly like on the markets. Do you, when will that come to a head? Is it impossible to, to call? Well, I, again, I would say there's, we're seeing opportunities already, yeah. and I think it's just continuing to sift through kind of what are, what are the best ones. And again, what, what an environment like this does is it really favors folks who are well capitalized, yeah. like us, yeah. who have the ability to navigate an environment where you may have less leverage, or you, know, you may want to, as a lender in our debt business, really use this as an opportunity to lend into the best buyer, borrowers with the best asset classes. And that, you know, in, in an environment where banks are pulling back, where, where you know, people are, are, are regulating some of their transaction right. yeah. activity, um, you can really find great opportunities. But there's, you know, there's not a day where you say, okay, we are now at bottom and it, it's time to go. I think you just, you know, keep finding those great opportunities. And we do think this will be a really transaction-rich environment. Kathleen, thank you so much for coming on today. That was Kathleen McCarthy, Blackstone's global co-head of real estate. Coming up, we asked why European bank valuations are still behind their U.S. peers. Don't well, don't miss that deep dive into the banking sector. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Back to the Pulse, everyone. The UK's financial regulator says it's investigating whether Crispin OD passes its fit and proper test to operate in the financial industry. Now, in a letter to British lawmakers on Monday, the FCA says it's focusing on allegations that OD dismissed the executive committee at OD Asset Management for, quote, an improper purpose. While well, the FCA executive director spoke to us earlier. I'm not going to be drawn on the details of what we may or may not do in relation to that specific case. I would just um, say that we do take allegations of non-financial misconduct seriously. It's right and proper that they are subject to due process and to a formal investigation. Uh, and I just encourage um, anyone in any firm, you've seen us talk repeatedly at the Financial Conduct Authority about the importance of healthy cultures. So uh, please do, if you have concerns around non-financial misconduct, make sure that they are reported to the appropriate authorities. Now, for more on all of this, let's go to our Bloomberg legal reporter, Jonathan Browning. Jonathan, I mean, what do we know so far? This is a case that, it, you know, every day there's something that looks worse. Yeah, there is. And the major new revelation today was that the FCA uh, acknowledged that some of the allegations that have um, been reported about Chris Benodi, and to be clear, these are allegations that he has denied, um, but these allegations uh, have been, uh, are potentially criminal in nature, and that they have been in contact with the police. Um, and that opens up a potentially whole new law enforcement process. So what's next in the investigation? So um, for the FCA, there will be an investigation into um, Chris Binodi himself, whether he's considered fit and proper, which is the regulator's broad assessment about whether someone has integrity to operate in the financial services space. They are also looking at OD Asset Management, the firm that bears his name. And then there is a question mark now as to whether or not the police themselves um, will uh, respond to the FCA's um, contact. But Jonathan, so far, so they're winding down, right, most of the funds. So even if he's not found to be f fit and proper, what happens to Crispin OD and, you know, Cris Crispin Asset Management? I mean, it's very hard. OD Asset Management is very, it's very hard to see um, how the firm in, and of, in its current, current shape can continue. The fund managers are going for the exit. Investors are pulling funds. The banks that serve as brokers to OAM have, have also cut ties. Um, we are yet to hear from Chris Binodi himself. His lawyers are not, um, not responding, except to say before that he has just denied the allegations. So, so we wait to hear on that front. All right, Jonathan, thank you so much. Bloomberg's legal reporter there, Jonathan Browning. Now, let's also switch focus to Europe's banking industry. The sell-off in bank stocks triggered by the collapse of Credit Suisse and several U.S. regional banks may be over, but the sector's recovery is faltering and actually suggests investor angst will persist. Philip Richards, Bloomberg Intelligence's senior banks analyst, joins us now. So European bank share prices have failed to return to levels before the U.S. regional banking crisis. Are fears over liquidity and deposits flight remaining? Actually, it's a bit different to that. We don't see any sort of liquidity concerns for the banks. Actually, deposits balances have been very stable um, in the first quarter results. And in the second quarter, in a couple of weeks' time, we expect that to be the case again. 
And where our concern is actually on, on the earnings side of the banks. And you know, until now, the banks have done very well with interest rate hikes. They've been passing that on to their mortgage costs, et cetera, but not passing it on to savers. And therefore, they've been able to widen their margin. However, where we are now is that the rates are almost at their peak levels. Um, and then they have to increasingly pass more and more of that across to savers. And that's really going to squeeze their margin and therefore potentially drive um, revenues down. So why do European banks continue to allow U.S. lenders in terms of valuations trading at much lower multiples? Yeah, well, part of it is the, simply the economy. The economy in the U.S. is doing much better than it is across most countries across Europe. Um, the regulators have seen as a more favorable environment um, in the U.S. Um, and then thirdly, it's simply on profitability. You've got J.P. Morgan um, generating about 15% return on equity. Um, and the other U U.S. banks, you know, well into double digits, whereas the European banks are typically at 7 or 8%. So the, the, simply those factors are important, but also just in terms of the, that whole dynamic I was talking about earlier, in terms of passing on those rates, it looks like actually revenues might peak and we're basically we're at a turn of the earnings cycle. So, Philip, higher interest rates in Europe have, of course, led to earnings estimate being raised for European banks. So how, why has this not lifted share prices? Yes, I mean, this is what we've been hoping for for the last eight years. We've had negative rates across Europe, and now we finally got it. We've had this 25% increase in profits, and yet the share prices, as you show in the chart there, have pretty much stayed flat um, you know, for several months now. And therefore, the actual devaluation, the multiples of the two, are actually uh, basically a multi-year lows. Um, part of that say, is just a whole fear that we've got the turn of the earnings cycle, and that's going to lead to estimates being downgraded. Um, another example is say costs have been growing about 6 or 8% in the last year. That didn't matter when revenues were growing at a double-digit rate. But if revenues are now going to be stable, significantly lower, then suddenly the banks have got negative jewels, as we call it, or a rising cost income ratio because costs are growing faster than revenues. Um, and then lastly, of course, we are going into a slowdown. And that's what happened to them in, in the slowdown. Typically, they go up. So all three of the lines, you know, revenues are flat, costs are still high, and bad debt's going up. You know, it's not a good combination. Philip Richards, thank you so much. Our senior bank analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence joining us on this important report. Now, also making news, global temperatures hit a record on Monday, underscoring the dangers of failing to tackle climate change. The average worldwide temperature was 17 degrees Celsius, just above the previous record reached in August 2016. Now, that's according to data from the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. And French supermarket group Casino says it's weighing two rival rescue plans. An offer made by a group known as 3F, led by three French businessmen, would inject 900 million euros of fresh money into the business with an equity portion of 450 million euros. A rival proposal, led by a Czech financier, would inject 1.3 billion euros in equity. Neither rival bids are the latest in a long-running saga for Casino, which has been seeking to cut debt. Its concentration in areas heavily reliant on tourism back fire during the pandemic and a strategy to raise prices more than its competitors also added to its troubles more recently. And Bloomberg has learned that Abu Dhabi and Austria's petrochemical company OMV is exploring a merger of Bourges and Borealis to create a chemicals and plastics giant worth more than $30 billion. Now, the talks are said to have been ongoing for several months. Vienna headquarter Borealis is 75% owned by OMV, with the rest held by Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. Now coming up, the UK's National Health Service is 75 years old today. It's a key political issue for the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, so we'll bring you first of its kind analysis of Bloomberg by of well by Bloomberg of NHS data. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is a pulse. I'm Francie Lacqua here in London. Now, here in the UK today marks the 75th anniversary of the founding of the National Health Service. It, first of its kind of analysis of the NHS in England, Bloomberg has underscored just how deep problems run in the service. It shows, for example, that almost every single area of England is failing to meet even half of eight key government indicators from bed availability to ambulance waiting times. Well, joining us for more is Bloomberg's Olivia Konati Ahulu, who worked on this deep dive. Olivia, always, always great to have you. I do some great work, and I urge everyone uh, to, to go and read some of the deep dive. So what exactly is the root of all these problems? Well, I think there's two things, because on the one hand, you've got an NHS with a huge amount of demand. Um, there's, you've got an aging population, a backlog from COVID, 
And when people are older, they're having kind of a greater number of quite serious issues. So there's that kind of stress. But then on top of that, you've got an NHS which is pretty largely agreed as underfunded, understaffed, and the staff who are there are really overworked and really, really stressed and feeling undervalued particularly with the cost of living crisis after COVID. So you've just got a health system which has got a huge amount of strain on it at the moment. So Olivia, what exactly has been the impact of Brexit? Well, I think one thing which we all remember is kind of the figure passes on the bus about how much money would go to the NHS from Brexit. And I think um, some people have kind of had difficulty in seeing where that's been emerged. But then the, also the key thing is staffing. So when it comes to professions such as nursing and social care, um, we used to rely really heavily on the EU. And the fact is that even when nurse numbers do rise, there's just the demand is so great. And um, to match the needs of the population, we just still need way more, essentially. So is this only, a, how much of this is a funding problem? Like how much of it is a staffing problem, a funding problem, and what's the way forward? Honestly, it's difficult to say because some people it's also about how the money is being used and that there's different ways potentially that the system could be adapted. Some people say there should be reform. Some people say that we've had enough reform. The government um, this week actually put out um, a workforce plan, which people have really been kind of anticipating, hopefully um, to answer some of the staffing issues and to bring more people into the NHS. But um, I would think on it, I would honestly say it's both. But I would say that the underfunding issue is a very, very common theme, not just even within the NHS, but all the services around it that kind of keep the population healthy, which prevent people from going to hospital in the first place. Um, people are saying that, that there's just more money needed in those areas as well. Olivia, thanks so much. Bloomberg Equality reporter Olivia Konati Ahulu there joining us. And of course, Olivia also joins us tomorrow for a deep dive on the NHS. That's at 9.30 a.m. tomorrow morning in our half an hour special focused on the UK. Now, we continue also looking at central banks. We have a European Central Bank Governing Council member and president of Banca d'Italia, Ignazio Visco, hitting back at colleagues who basically say that policymakers should not worry about raising borrowing costs too far. Now, this has been for quite some time the line of Italy saying the ECB is to blame for any kind of trouble at home because they're raising rates too quickly. Now, uh, it's very clear that uh, Mr. Visco's um, you know, various remarks that have just come out and crossed the Bloomberg terminal appear to counter those from Hawks, such as executive board member Isabel Schnabel, who said just last month that Central Bank should err on the side of doing too much. That was Mr. Visco uh, talking there. He's one of the more dovish officials at the ECB, ECB and he spoke weeks before a decision where officials really have effectively committed to raising rates again by a quarter point. That was the message in Sintra, Portugal last week and that was very, very clear. Now, before we let you go, let's check on the markets. It's all to do with China and some of the data that was disappointing from China, European stocks, seeing a bit of pressure as the latest data from China showed that there's more weakness in the world's second biggest economy. Again, it's the sputtering services industry, which is really raising concern about the outlook for the global economic growth at a time when most major central banks are still in tightening mode. Now, a reminder, another reminder that you can also watch our full interview with the Greek Prime Minister. He's Kyriakos Mitsotakis. That's a special edition of Leaders with L'Aqua. That's on July 19th throughout the day. Up next, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Kriti Gupta in New York, Guy Johnson in London, and this is Bloomberg.